the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India is the world's second largest accounting and auditing body. The Institute has proudly completed 70 years of providing excellence and has coined a new theme, celebrating the past, inspiring the future. The theme for the 30th annual international seminar is People, Purpose and Passion, the Pathway to Progress. And that is about startups. So startups have become a talk of the town these days. You know, many of us may be probably angel investors, venture catalysts and whatnot. But startup world is a different world in its own. A girl was born in the entrepreneurship of the entrepreneurship. When she got to meet me, she asked me, how is it a startup? How is it a startup? Next slide, please. I have a bungla, a car, a car, a position. What do you have? I have a start-up. VC, you are looking for me and I am waiting for you here. In this start-up, how many people are hiding behind this start-up? What do you know, investor, Babu? Customers are all of them. No one is paid. इतनी शिद्दत से ज्ञान वो ही दे सकते हैं जिन्होंने इतनी शिद्दत से स्टार्टअप किया हो। And we are very privileged to have two startup amateurs with us right now, who will be sharing their stories with us. So let's hear it out for them. I'd like to invite committee member C. A. Sapan to please introduce the panelists. Thank you, C. A. Prenka, and thank you, Shilpa, for the nice background. So lot of things. It's my privilege to do the honor for the introduction of the, our pan panelists today. So first I will request C.A. Rajesh to play the interview video of Mr. Abhishek Bansal. Mr. Abhishek Bansal is a co-founder and CEO of Shadow Facts. He is an alumnus of IIT Delhi. Prior to founding Shadow Facts in 2015, he was working as a consultant for Corn Ferry Hay Group, where he was responsible for managing the restructuring assignment for one of the largest global retailers across USA and China. He also briefly worked at Pratham, an NGO focused on training youth from economically disadvantaged background and providing them with employable skills. Abhishek is a part of Champions of Change, an initiative by Niti Aayog to have a continuous dialogue between large institutions and startup environment. Abhishek's mantra of life is to solve any problems from its roots after finding its cause. Thoughts of innovation and problem solving continually keep alive the aspirations in him. Thank you, Rajesh. May I have Mr. Abhishek Bansal on the stage? Thank you. Now I request uh, C. Rajesh to please the, play the introduction video of Mr. John Kuruvilla. Mr. John Kuruvilla is a co-founder and CRO of Kalpnik Technologies Private Limited. John has more than three decades of diverse experience, including marketing, sales, brand building, customer relations. John comes with a rich background in advertising and has been instrumental in the creation and launch of several successful brands in the country, including award-winning and memorable campaigns like Hamara Bajaj, Maruti Omni, Maruti Gypsy, among others. He hung up his boots in advertising after winning a lion at Khan in 2000. He was the Chief Revenue Officer at Air Deccan, an Executive Vice President for Marketing for Oberoi Hotels and Resorts Worldwide. John has helped turn around several loss-making companies. He has mentored several startups, Oravel, now Oyo, Snaproot, Book Your Table, to name a few. As Managing Director of Gen Next Ventures, he led investments in IP-rich startups in India and overseas. John is a visiting faculty at IIM Bangalore, Symbiosis Institute of Management and IMT Nagpur. Good afternoon, Abu Dhabi. Um, I know it's an hour before lunch, so we'll try and keep it exciting. But it's truly a privilege for both of us to be here today amongst two of the most successful startups in the world. Pavanji explained to us about the Dabbawala. It's the most efficient company in the world with 5,000 people. And, of course, Abu Dhabi, the richest city in the world, started with sand dunes 
and today is a bustling metropolis. And both these startups started with no investors. It was the founding vision of the fathers of both these organizations that has got us to where we are. So let's start with that. Thank you, ICA, for inviting us. We'll try and keep it interesting, but would request you to kindly ask as many questions as possible, because that's the only way we can share our experience. I'd like to just share one insight here. This is a white chasm of a generation. <laughs> can anybody take a guess of Abhishek's age when he started his startup? Anybody? How much? He was 24 when he started. Can anybody understand how many years of experience I have? That's two generations. <laughs> so Abhishek, why don't you start with sharing something about, let's close the gap. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank John for the nice intro. I think, first of all, I'd like to thank the Abu Dhabi chapter for inviting us. It's been a pleasure over here, and it's been a pleasure over here listening since morning. There have been a bunch of motivational and very informative sessions. So Shadow Facts, we started in early 2015, and this is basically a company which is a B2B logistics firm where we try and provide last mile logistics to e-commerce players, grocery players, food delivery players. And today, Shadowfax is one of the largest last mile delivery platform in India where we do about one and a half lakh orders on a per day basis. And this is across food delivery, grocery delivery, and e-commerce delivery. The unique thing about this particular platform is that today we have it's a 100% crowdsourced platform. So essentially, we don't employ people. They are people who come on their own will. They basically download our app, install it, and then they start working and earn money and go back home. Within a period of three years, we have actually been able to create a network of around 55,000 people across India. Out of that, about 10,000 people come on our platform daily, make money, and go back. We think this is a big achievement over there in India. We think we are really creating a big impact out there for the people who are working with us. And we think that we'll be able to scale this platform to roughly about a million people in the next five years. And out of that, about 20-25% people will be able to make money on the platform on a daily basis. Till date, we have raised about $40 million of risk, risk capital. And uh, this, is a, this is a very technology-intensive business, unlike how the Dabawala was. And uh, it's a very similar business from values perspective, I think. Uh, but I think the way we are playing it is in a very technology-friendly way, where people can actually download our platform, work on it, go back home without actually reporting to anybody out here. So yeah, that's a quick intro on this. So maybe, John, before we start, I think definitely I'll love to understand and everybody would want to understand you're like you have been through a crazy journey okay you have been in aviation you have been in uh, travel you have been in e-commerce you have been in venture capital I mean how has been the journey and today you are doing something which is very very interesting maybe probably if you can talk a bit about that as well I think it'll be interesting for the audience sure so like somebody said yesterday you have to be a little crazy to be an entrepreneur and you have to be absolutely mad to be an entrepreneur four times. So my first startup was in 2000. Um, I created India's largest online real estate platform. It was called, Pla it was called Prop Mart, and it was a builder friend of mine. And uh, our biggest markets were Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Qatar, Oman, Muscat, and Saudi Arabia, because this was the largest population of people buying properties in India without understanding the credibility of the broker community or the real estate builder in India. And we were fortunate enough to get investments from HDFC, and we piggyback on HDFC's credibility to create services to the NRIs in this part of the world. Exciting journey, exited that company in three years, then joined a friend of mine who started an airline. And uh, you'd be shocked to know that that company, Air Deccan, was started with one crore of equity and four crore in debt. One aircraft, a turboprop, in 2003 cost $16 million. And in three years' time, we went from a 100 crore revenue to a 3,000 3, crore revenue in 30 months, and we IPO'd, and I made some money and decided to call it quits. I decided to hang up my boots, but my wife said, listen, divorce is inimitable if you stay at home, go get a job, <laughs> because I'm restless. So within 72 hours of leaving Deccan, I joined the Oberoi Hotels as head of marketing and sales for the group worldwide. And I remember asking Mr. Oberoi, why me? 
I am a mass guy. Uber is about luxury. I don't even own a pair of, I, I don't own a suit. And he said, you don't know your strength. Your strength is customer insight. And that journey lasted beautifully. And then I did my third startup where I was a venture fund. I was, I was an ER in residence with battery ventures in the US. And I, so we IPO'd um, Air Deccan. And the third startup, I raised $9 million. Remember the first startup, I didn't raise money. Second startup, we had no money. Third startup, I, ra I started with $9 million. And I had to leave the company in a year because I had problems with one investor and my partners. And within another year, they shut the company. So a lot of entrepreneurs believe that if you have funding, you're safe. Funding puts a lot of emotional and moral pressure on the individual, and it's not a sure sign, sign for success. So that was my third startup. And then I happened to meet by, by chance Dr. Marshall Kerr, who is on the board of Reliance Industries and on the board of Tata, and he said, I like your model. Why don't you come and manage Reliance Industries Venture Fund? And I remember telling him, Dr. Marshall, I know nothing about managing a fund. I know enough about running companies. He said, Tab, calm karo. you find great companies, we'll invest in it, and you make those companies successful. So I ran GenX Ventures, it's a Reliance Industries fund from the balance sheet for three years. And then Mr. Ambani told me, look, all this is fine. India has a lot of youngsters who need mentorship, set up an accelerator program. So I set up GenNext Hub, and we have mentored startups who within six months of leaving the company, raised 10 to $20 million, and there are three, four of them, all youngsters like you, uh, 27, 28, and uh, ran that for three years, and then chairman asked me to, to set up uh, Reliance Industry, Geo's uh, virtual classroom, set that up, lasted five years there, didn't like working for a large corporate, got off and uh, have now started my fourth startup, which is leveraging augmented reality and virtual reality to help people engage with their faith. So you're right, completely different industries, but that's the challenge and the madness that keeps me going. Yeah, I think, thanks, that was a great thing. But before we start, I think, I think we have seen various phases of fundraise financing. And one of the things that I really value is the contribution to, of the entire CA community to us. I mean, without all of you guys, I don't think any of the work that we have done would have been possible. We are not CAs, but I mean, the kind of importance our CA team holds within our respective companies, I think it's great. I think I would love to have a big round of applause for the entire community over here, which is seated. Yeah. So uh, again, I think the way we thought that we'll probably want to have this uh, discussion is we would want it to be a more participative thing and rather than probably us telling us various ideas or various th ways that we think it will be great if we can actually have a lot of participation from the people over here and be it related to fundraise or be it related to any other questions, I think we'll be happy to answer all of that. Right, John? So on the, on the point of the importance of a CA, Air Deccan had a, a very disruptive CA. His name was Mohan Kumar. Now you have to understand that we had no money. We were broke every month because we were burning 50 lakhs a day negative. And we didn't have money to keep funding. So we were selling tickets in advance to actually keep the company going. And then we realized that if we have to take on Jet Airways, Sahara and India Airlines, we needed money in the bank. And we scratched our head. And we said, how do we do this? And he said, John, you're the revenue guy. You increase sales. I said, Mon, you get me more aircraft. So it was a chicken and egg. So he did something very interesting. First time in my life, a chartered accountant leveraged forward receivables with a bank and took a loan of 200 crores. Amazing. So what do we do? We were selling tickets 90 days out. He went to this bank and we didn't pay any special monies. We just told the bank, look, we're gonna change aviation forever. And uh, he said, look, give me 200 crores. I will bring in 10 more aircraft. And every rupee that we earn gets into an escrow with the bank. You deduct your principal and balance and keep giving us the money. So we raised 200 crores from a public sector bank, paid it off in a year and a half, raised another $50 million from ICICI Ventures and Capital Ventures uh, in, 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 in um, Singapore, 
and then in 2006 we IPO'd. So the role of the chartered accountant, and let me tell you one thing, I have mentored a lot of youngsters, financial indiscipline is one of the key reasons why startups fail. And when I say financial indiscipline, I'm not just talking of managing books and accounts, but also the lack of innovation in the way money is managed, both from the investor and from how you receive money from the customers, is a big issue. I think interesting. I have a very similar story to tell, probably not of the similar size of impact. Uh, so when we t started in 2015, back in India, the market was really bullish on the entire startup space. And people were actually believing, like, having a billion dollar, a million dollar burn rate per month is like casual out there. Okay, and what we realized that the market is actually not that promising and there are ups and downs which can actually happen. And we had a very, very severe cost saving policy. Okay, like negotiating on every rupee that needs to be spent. And uh, you wouldn't believe, like in the, two, in the two, 2016, the entire market crashed. We had about five competitors out there in the market. Everybody disappeared within 12 months. We were the only people left, and I think the single most important thing that I value, why we were actually the last minute standing where we were very, very cost sensitive. Okay, we didn't waste even a single rupee. I mean, I remember my CFO, my commercial team was actually like even negotiating to the point like who is going to actually clean the carpet in the office, and like not even wasting a single rupee on that. I mean, that the kind of cost saving attitude that you actually need to make it happen. Otherwise, like in India or in Dubai or anywhere in the world, people are always very cost sensitive. Okay, if you have to build businesses, the businesses need to show margin. I think I really agree on that point from you. Yeah. So I wish a question to you. Yeah. Why did you start so young? You are educated. I think you were studying. A good And uh, 24 to chuck all this up and. Pretty interesting. So when I was working in my consulting times, I was 24. I was actually at a good point in my career. I was performing really well over there. What I realized was that the corporate career, like you grow at a very, very slow pace or even if you like fast track your performance, you'll probably be growing at a 15, 20% year on year basis. Okay. I thought that's not good enough for me. My aims are slightly more higher than that. And what I actually thought was, okay, I'm 24. Let me invest two years into it. What will happen even if I fail? I'll be just two years behind my batch or two years behind where I should be. Probably where, when I'm 50, I'll be, uh, I would say, like, like no, no, not like you. <laughs> I'll be happy if I'm like you. <laughs> probably, like, what, what I'll get at 50, I'll probably would have got at 48 if I have not wasted these two years. But I won't lose my essence. Then there's a great learning over there. And that's why I took the tip. And once you get into it, you actually realize that, oh, it's, it's a never-ending loop. And the more you do, the more you learn, and you keep on like learning with that. And the learning is like, I would say, it's indispensable over a long period of time. You know, there's an interesting discussion I had with Abhishek. When he wanted to do a startup, he resigned from his job, moved out of Delhi where his parents stayed, and moved to Bombay for one year without a job, but he didn't have the guts to tell his parents that he's unemployed. Am I right? Yeah. Why do you do that? I mean. I didn't have an idea when I left my job and uh, like the idea was pretty hazy, it was not yet tried off, the margins were thin and my dad, my family is from a business family, okay, so they asked very business oriented questions, I didn't have those answers and I like why to put people in a very discomfort zone, once probably if I have something I'll come back home and tell them that this is what I'm really doing and rather than getting into any distraction but I was very clear that I'll do something. Okay, that I'll make it big, I'll figure out something and then probably will be a good time to come back to the family and uh, clarify all their doubts. <laughs> so one of the challenges that we have in the startup world is funding. How difficult was it for you to raise money? So, interestingly, raising, so raising money is a function of multiple things. It's a function of the team, it's a function of idea, it's a function of where the market is and where the overall macro is. Luckily, when we were raising money for the first time ever, it was actually not that difficult at that time because the market, the macro, everything sounded pretty good to the investors. What has happened after that is with every subsequent round, I would say raising money has become almost like 10 times more difficult than what it was in the previous round. And uh, I think timing over there is very, very important. But uh, challenges are obvious, like, I mean, fundraise, as you keep on scaling your company, you're building a business, okay, people look what is the kind of value that you are generating? It's not about always about revenue. It's not about like the valuation that 
everybody talks about. It's also a lot about the value that you're creating for your customers, for your clients. And fundamentals are something which are always questioned upon. So if you don't have fundamentals, okay, nothing is easy. I mean, you can't raise money in the market. But if you're building a very, very strong company, if you're very customer focused, if you're creating value out there, there's a win-win situation that you're creating both for your stakeholders as well as for your customers, I think raising money is not difficult. And I think it is also about the passion with which you perceive your particular idea. Investors love that. Investors don't like founders who are resistant, who are not confident about the kind of idea that they are pursuing. Okay, investors have a very, very long-term approach. They think for 10 years down the line. Is this a team that can actually take that particular idea 10 years, 15 years down the line? Are they committed enough for doing that? I think those are the key things that we found very, very useful while we were doing fundraising. What's your view on fundraising? I mean, you have also gone through that multiple times, multiple things in your journey as well, yeah. So one interesting lesson I learned in life is when you have a safety net of deep pockets, you stop taking risks. Uh, the startups that succeeded for me, we raised very little money. And when you have little money, you tend to use it far more prudently. More important, you take that many bigger risks. Uh, so my first startup, PropMart, I put in money, we raised a crore. And in three years, we had a GMV of 540 crores. Deccan, we had five crores. And in three years, we were 3,000 crores. And I, today in hindsight, realize that when you have adversity facing you every day, the importance of you to survive and therefore look at very disruptive thinking becomes key to your, your success. When you have too much money, and I'll tell you, both in PropMart and in Airdekin, in Airdekin in the third year we had 5,000 people. We were paying salaries of 30% less than market. And this is the, the discussion Dr. Pavanji talked. We were calling people and saying, anybody who asked us, and you know, yesterday uh, uh, Dr. Shetty talked about it, in an interview, if anybody asked me, how much money am I going to get? I will get up, shake his hands and say, thank you very much. And they'd be surprised. Interview is over. I said, yeah, you're not on for the job. But people who said, look, what do you want from me? And the first thing we would tell them is, we want you to take a 30% cut in salary. We'll give you equity. And remember in 2003, people didn't understand the value of equity. It's only now in the past five, seven years with Just Dial, with Flipkart, with uh, red bus, people have understood the value of equity. And people who are willing to take a minimum 15% cut in salary were the people we decided to hire because they then became evangelists and believers in the company. And, and, and that was, in fact, when I was looking up Abu Dhabi, the reason why this, this part of the world deserves accolades is that in a startup, Abhishek, you can hire and fire people. Yeah. <laughs> in a country, you can't do that. You have to carry a nation with you. You can't say, hey, you don't believe me? Leave the country. You can't. It's far more difficult building a nation. Therefore, kudos to the founding fathers of, of an organization like this that we see the wealth around. Yeah. So huge challenges. And I think companies that are built on the foundation of great values, great purpose, don't need money, money will follow you. I think that's very interesting, like, uh, from the fact that somebody gave me a very good advice, okay? You go to an investor and you ask for money, he'll give you advice. You go to an investor and ask him for advice, he'll actually chase you with money. <laughs> and, I mean, it's very interesting, like, the more you chase after money, valuations, people start distracting you, the more, as Mr. Pavanji talked about, like, you do good work, you do, you create value, you think about the customer, people give you attention, okay, they'll come after you with money, with recognition, with whatever you want out there, and I think that's how the world is. <laughs> and I think uh, the power of imagination is far more powerful than the power of money in the bank. Um, the more you imagine, the more you disrupt, the more you innovate, the more you think out of the box, the better it is for your company, and money is then a byproduct. In fact, I tell a lot of youngsters, don't, don't chase money, don't chase valuation. Unlock value, money will come. And, you know, I'm honored to have Dr. Velumani here who's going to be speaking after, after us, 
But here's a man whose story is amazing. I mean, doctor, it, it'll be a pleasure to see you again. But here's a man who, from nowhere, has built one of the most powerful healthcare companies in the world, which IPO'd. So you don't need money. And here's, here's also a standing testimony that you don't need money. The power of ideas, the power of conviction, and what you have, three words, purpose, people, and, 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 and another fourth, which is processes, which will actually take you to the next level. I just want to add two things. You know, you have heard of AI. I believe there are two critical things for a startup. It's called DI. It's data and instinct. Today, the one difference between Abhishek's generation, our generation is, there's enough information that they have and they want instant gratification. In my generation, to do a call to Abu Dhabi, STD was three hours, lightning was 10 minutes, today it's all on a call. I remember doing homework when I did my first startup and I used to sit in Times of India's office and go through microfilms. But that's how data was captured. So the power of data and the power of your instinct. And very often, we tend to stop listening to our instincts and go with what the world is telling us is far more powerful than, than money. Yeah, agree, completely agreed on that, I think, yeah. So what yeah. we suggest is, I mean, we can, okay, I'll just, I mean, the Dabbawalas were a phenomenal story. Abhishek's company does one and a half lakh deliveries a day yeah. with 9,000 people of which, or 10,000 people of which 9,500 people don't even work for him. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> How do you manage that? I think it's a challenging task. Okay, making people to convince thinking it as a part-time job is very difficult. So one of the things that we have been heavily focused on is how do you get part-timers? How do you make it make people feel more independent about working with shadow facts. So like just taking a very simple example, one of our biggest target audience today is college students, people working in government jobs. And these are people who have enough time in the day or in the late evenings to come on the platform and uh, and make money. And what we've also seen is these are the people who actually have an intention of making money rather than forcefully taking it. So I think that has been like finding who's your correct target audience has, was probably one of our biggest challenges. Uh, moving after that, I think we have built a very, very strong technology platform in order to, how do we manage so many people coming online and basically working with us. So one of the things that we constantly focus on is Basically, we use a lot of location-based algorithms in our system through which we understand where the person is standing, is he available to work right now, what is his rating, what is his customer experience score, and uh, we continuously build that. So, for example, as compared to a Dabbawala, so Dabbawalas are employed full-time with a Dabbawala platform. You can actually trust them with a, uh, so that this is how, like, for them maintaining service level, I would say is still controllable as compared to us, where we cannot, like, we cannot even trust those people. We don't know those people yet, okay? And these are Dabbawala, in a Dabbawala scenario, these people, the Dabbawalas are working with them for a very, very long time. They are actually employed with them. And they are like generations of people who are working with them. In our kind of an ecosystem, people come and go every year, okay? Our, like, the entire base that we have, we know that this will, like, go off, we'll have a completely new base within about one and a half to two years, okay? So how do you use data, as I, as I think you pointed out, how do we use data to make basically very, very smart decisions out there and control thousands of people on the ground really become the trick and the core IP that we keep on building on the ground. Avishek, what two things that keep you awake at night? Two things that keep me awake. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's there with every business. I think how do you grow fast and how do you become profitable? And uh, I mean, that's the core of, I think, every business because, uh, I mean, doing day-to-day -day work is something which you build processes over a period of time. But how do you look forward in the future? What is going to happen five years, seven years down the line is something that I think interests me and as well, I think it takes a lot of my time as well. Okay. So what we will do uh, in the interest of, of participation, I have got um, two books on the story of Edekin. And uh, these are autographed by Captain Gopinath himself. Um, how many of you have flown Edekin? Oh, that's a handful, okay. Um, how many of you have flown in the 500 rupee ticket? None of you. Oh, you have. Um, so when we launched the, did you fly on the 500 rupee ticket? When we launched the 500 rupee ticket, everybody thought we were a bunch of idiots who'd lost it. And the actual reason was we had 43% load factor, 
57% of our seats were going empty. We were running out of cash. Jet had a marketing budget of 60 crores. I had a marketing budget of 50 lakhs. So what we do, to put one extra body on a plane was about $2. So we said on every aircraft on an Airbus A320, put just six seats at 500 rupees. And in three years, Jet spent 200 crores in marketing. In three years, Air Deccan got 632 crores worth of free publicity, wow. thanks to my 500 rupee tickets. <laughs> now that was very disruptive, and it only happened because we didn't have a choice. We had seats going empty, customers wanted seats, and the press thought every ticket was going at 500. We didn't correct them, we didn't agree to it, but we had lines of people, traffic jams, cases were filed against us because we were disrupting traffic, but every news for a startup was good news. <laughs> and, and that's how we did it. So there is an interesting thing. So what we're going to do is that the first gentleman who asks a question gets a book, and the first lady who asks a question gets a book. We'll at least start the trigger. The danger is you're on TV, so you'll get captured. So, so go ahead and ask question. We often come and listen to the success stories, but we learn more from the failures. Why don't we talk about the failures? Because successes are very less and failures are more. So can you tell us something about anything which you have failed in your startups or what precautions one should take to avoid those failures? Thanks for the question. I think very interesting question. So startup is a place you actually fail every day. Okay, today I think about like 10 new ideas every day. I think I and know with the point that at least seven will fail by the end of the day itself. Okay, so it's, I think it's a continuous learning perspective that you need to apply over here. Even with us, like as a business, we actually like the idea that we started with initially, it was only related to food delivery. And what we realized is that the entire mathematical model is actually flawed because as you start scaling up, the cost increases radically as compared to what you put in the financial model. And these are things, these are variables which you are not known to you when you basically start the system and uh, the entire system crashes down, okay. And uh, I think at that moment of time, if you rely that you essentially don't have a safety net, as you earlier pointed out, you actually have to come out with innovation. You have to focus on things which are actually making difference to your customer, which are adding value into the system. And then you make the course correction. So one of the things that one needs to accept is the fact that they'll fail. Everybody will fail. Okay, there is a very, very low probability that you will succeed, but you just have to f make that, I think, probability a possibility out there. So I'll give you a very interesting question. So I, the three places that I teach, I take a subject called failing to succeed. Because my logic is if you have not failed, you've not tried something new. And I'll give you a classic case of a failure in my life. After I raised $9 million, uh, I left the company in a year, and then my co-founders ran that company to the ground. And that was the age of social media. So there was a predator VC who takes great joy in going after entrepreneurs who failed, and he came after me. And the one thing that actually messes with the human mind is your ego. So when he came after me, I was humiliated publicly, and for one and a half months, I locked myself in my house and didn't want to get out. And my wife kept telling me, listen, you've had such a brilliant career. This is one failure. Are you telling me that you've not failed in life? And I actually sat back and realized that because I'd failed so many times, what the outside world sees is only your success story. And success, sir, is always hindsight. We created a, I mean, you've heard of Hamara Bajaj, okay? Um, Mr. Bajaj called us and said, look, Bajaj scooters are getting impacted because there was a very effeminate looking scooter called Kinetic Honda without a gear. And there was 
um, Hero Honda's uh, four-stroke motorcycle, and they were hitting the sales of scooters. And he said, look, I need you to do something that can actually sustain the growth of scooters. And we realized after a lot of research, after a lot, there was no internet those days, a lot of research that there was a lot of loyalty for a Bajaj scooter, and a Bajaj scooter changed generations. So the first campaign we did, which failed miserably, none of you know it, was called the Great Indian Spirit. <laughs> it was, we spent a crore and a half on the outside back covers of India today, and we ran campaigns which associate Bajaj with iconic events like the Mahabharat, cricket, Bollywood, and one year later, there were, six months later, there was no sign of success. By accident, in Mogambo Cafe, I met a creative director, and he created this whole thing of Buland Bharat ki Buland Tasweer, and within four months, the campaign succeeded. But that was a failure none of you know of. Kawasaki Cheetah was another campaign. It was India's first campaign where a bike turned to Cheetah. We won awards all over the world. The product failed miserably because the campaign promised speed, which the RTZ could not deliver vis-a-vis -vis an RX100. Another failure. But these were failures on someone else's money, so it didn't impact us. When Taggle failed, it was some of my money going down, and it was public humiliation. So you have to not get up after a failure. You have to spring back after a failure and then be determined that the lessons I learned from failure, I will not repeat in future. And that's the story of there are enough failures that one has had. Yeah. Ma'am, you wanted a question? Uh, you said that when you had the media cover your 500 rupee tickets, weren't you worried that it would negatively affect your company? Yes. So um, when the media covered us, we didn't care. We had no money in the bank. We were dying anyway. So we didn't care, we were dying anyway. It was an act of desperation. And that desperation worked well, which is why I think ICA has called me here, otherwise it would have sunk without a trace and we wouldn't be sitting here. Like I said, all success are hindsight. Do you agree, Dr. Velumani? So that's your answer. Uh, did we, had we, you know, that's another thing we, we, I, I've learned. Never think twice about the repercussions, plan for it. But go with the flow. And I learned one very important lesson in life. You have to learn to change a wheel in a moving car. It's possible. So keep, keep at it. Thank you so much, John. Thank you, Abhishek. You have rightly pointed out that success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Swami Vivekanand has rightly said, in a day when you don't come across any problem, you are sure that you are not traveling on a right path. So keep having failures because it will keep you moving towards new journeys. I'd like to invite uh, our chapter chairman, C. Ashish, uh, team social leader Rohit Daima, and C. Ramesh Mahalingam to please come over and present a token of appreciation to Abhishek. I request C.A. Sridhar Iyengar to please join us here to present a token of appreciation to C. Uh, John. <laughs> <laughs> 